Hello, this is Eric White. This is the fifth screencast in a series on writing recursive pure functional transforms of XML documents. This screencast series is oriented towards a typical object-oriented programmer who has not had exposure to some of the more fundamental constructs that you will encounter when writing pure functional code. In fact, I'm orienting these screencasts towards a friend who is a competent object-oriented developer but doesn't have this exposure to FP. In addition, there is a developer at a customer that I've been working with, and this developer also competent object-oriented developer and hasn't had exposure to these ideas in functional programming. So I'm covering some of the basics in this screencast series. If you already know about closures and understand the issues associated with closures, feel free to skip this screencast and move on to the screencast that starts the real meat of this series on doing recursive pure functional transforms. One point I want to make though is that very few developers, including experienced functional programming developers, have seen or have studied recursive pure functional transforms. So even if you understand closures completely, and if you understand lambda expressions completely, but you do not know about recursive pure functional transforms, I encourage you to pick up this screencast series in the screencast that commences talking about recursive pure functional transforms. In a nutshell, closures make the language, be it C Sharp or be it JavaScript, work the way that you think it should work. This statement is true provided that you practice pure functional programming techniques. There's a kind of a dichotomy between functional programming techniques. These are often called declarative programming techniques or a declarative style of writing code contrasted to procedural code, which is imperative style of writing code. In other words, declarative code, you're saying what you want to have happen. Imperative code, you're saying how to do what you want to do. And imperative code almost by definition requires that you mutate state. You, for instance, have classes, you have state in those classes, you're writing code that tells how to operate with an object of that particular class and that code makes use of that state in that object. And if you mix imperative procedural code with declarative functional code, you would often end up trying to modify state in the middle of a functional programming query. And this is, in general, a bad thing. This results in a situation where at certain points in time in a query, or at certain places in the query in certain lambda expressions, you expect a variable to have a certain value, and when you actually run your code, it has a different value due to this problem of mixing imperative code and declarative code and closures. So my key point about that closures make the language work the way you think it should is this point is true provided that you practice pure functional programming techniques. We're going to talk about purity two screencasts from now. The next screencast, I'm going to talk about laziness and eagerness. The screencast following that one, I'm going to talk about pure functional programming techniques and what purity means. So the best way to discuss closures is to look at some actual code. Here we have a very small C-sharp program. This C-sharp program, it's a little bit interesting in that we have this method multiplier, and this method multiplier returns a function, and this method multiplier takes an argument of m, and it stores that argument m in a local variable, and the function that it returns takes a single argument z, and multiplies that z by the local variable 
which is a variable that is on the stack. This example is very, very artificially simplified, but it is an example of a type of technique that you'll use. You'll encounter this type of technique when you are writing functional programs. If you look at how this example would operate if you didn't have closures, then here we can see that we have called the function multiplier and we passed in an argument of five. This function multiplier sets local variable to five and then it returns another function that multiplies its argument by whatever is in that local variable. In other words, if we use that function f1, it will multiply whatever we pass in to f1 by five. Same thing here where we call multiplier passing an argument of three and we get back a function that whatever we pass to that function, it will return a value that is multiplied by three. If we didn't have closures, what would happen is we would call the multiplier method, we'd pass five into it, it would set the local variable named local variable to five, it would return this function, and then multiplier would return and the stack would unroll and that local variable that the lambda expression in multiplier referred to, that local variable would have been now rolled up off the stack. It would no longer exist. Instead, what happens is that when the C-sharp compiler sees this lambda expression and sees that this lambda expression refers to local variable, the C-sharp compiler takes that local variable and promotes it from a variable that is on the stack and it makes it a variable on the heap and this variable on the heap is tied for garbage collection purposes to this lambda expression. Actually, it's tied to the closure that sits behind the lambda expression. A closure is actually a data structure that sits behind that lambda expression. But for all practical purposes, we can think of it as being tied to that lambda expression. So if we run this program, we first of all set up F1 so that it will multiply any value that we pass to F1 by five. It sets up F2 as a function that any value passed to F2 is multiplied by three. And now down here, we call F1 passing two. So this will print out 10. We call the function F2 and we pass one to F2. And so this will print out three. And then we again call F1 and we pass one to F1 and this will print out five. And this will demonstrate that the local variable has been captured two separate times by those two lambda expressions. And when we run it, we see exactly what we expected to see, which is it prints out 10, three, and five. And for the sake of completeness, let's look at the exact same example in JavaScript. Here is the same example in JavaScript. We have this method multiplier that takes an argument m. It sets a local variable named local variable and sets that variable to m and then it returns a lambda expression that multiplies the argument to the lambda expression by whatever is in that local variable. We then declare a variable f1 and set that to the re result of calling multiplier passing five. We declare a variable f2 and set that to the result of calling multiplier passing in three. And then we call f1 passing in two, f2 passing in one, and again, f1 passing in one, exactly the same as the previous example in C-sharp. And we print out the results of calling those methods. And if I run this, we see the exact same results in the browser, 10, three, and five. Key point about this is when used properly, closures simply make the language work the way you think it should work. That if closures didn't work that way, when you wrote this lambda expression in the method multiplier, you couldn't refer to that local variable. However,
because closures are there, it lets us refer to that local variable in the Lambda expression and everything works as we expect it to. There are people who demonstrate closures and demonstrate the issues of closures when you mix imperative and declarative code, and you can get into some really strange programming bugs that result from that. So instead of getting into all of those types of programming bugs and studying the semantics of how side effects in the middle of a lambda expression affect the results of the lambda expression, instead of doing that, we're just going to get into the habit of writing pure code. Life is too short to try to debug these problems of mixing declarative code and imperative code that has side effects. That's all I'm going to cover in the screencast. Talk to you next time. In the next screencast, I am going to talk about laziness and eagerness in queries.